Hi, my name is Karen Hess. Today I thought I'd share an activity with you that I call a handy brain model that explains to your students why engagement is so important. Uh, this is in my new book, A Rigor by Design, Not Chance. When I began teaching, I did what I called performance-based assessment 1.0. That was when I designed engaging tasks, fun activities for my students. I did all of the design. There was very little assessment involved with that. And while my students were fully engaged, there were probably a lot of missed opportunities for assessing what they actually learned. Over the years, I moved into where most people are today, which I call performance-based assessment 2.0. That's where we embed a project or a task in a curriculum, still designed by the teacher, and I did a lot of thinking and designing about what these would look like. I gave my students some choices, but for the most part, it was my task, my design. They resulted in a summative project that could be assessed, and students could be shown examples of what exemplary products looked like. That was all good, but it was mostly focused on cognitive engagement, not the emotional engagement that my earlier projects involved. So now I've come to realize that we need to move into a new phase, which I call PBA's 3.0. That's where you focus on a real world problem or complex task that may have no solution, but it engages students in coming up with questions, investigations, both processes of learning and products of learning can be assessed. And the addition to the assessment piece is that students self-assess, they reflect on their learning. So that's the type of assessment I'm talking about, one where students are involved and engaged. I put these into two categories. The first are performance tasks, and those usually focus on a problem. They're student-centered problems, so they're open-ended. Uh, they may have multiple ways to approach the problem. They might have multiple possible solutions. The second category are extended projects and project-based learning. And we've all heard and read about project-based learning uh, in the last uh, couple of years. This is, again, student-centered. It usually takes longer than a single performance task. Students answer complex questions about the world around them and generally share the products of their learning with an audience outside of the classroom. I see these as part of a continuum of performance-based assessment. So if you want your students to work on an extended project, you begin with some short cycle assessments that uncover their thinking, that engage them first emotionally and then cognitively. And you move through tasks that I call scrimmages, small performance tasks that allow them to practice without keeping score, allow them to reflect on their learning and build their understanding so that eventually they are ready for project-based learning or a capstone project. A lot of the times teachers say, that sounds good, Karen, but how do you get kids to do this? So I've been using this, what I call a handy brain model, for many years that explains to students how their brain works and why all the parts of the brain need to be engaged. So if you think for a minute, if you were to make two fists, put them together so your fingernails are touching, that gives them a pretty good model of what their brain looks like, although the curled fingers would be a larger proportion of the brain. The arms would represent the spinal cord bringing information into the brain. So we have our two hemispheres of the brain, a left and a right hemisphere, and what we have are four important brain lobes. The first is the occipital lobe, which is the pinky fingers. That's in the back of your head. If you hit on the back of the head, you black out, you see stars. That's the vision center. And that is where our pinky fingers would be represented. Just above that is the temporal lobe. The temporal lobe uh, brings other auditory uh, sensory information into play. And the temporal lobe talks to the limbic system, the hippocampus, and it decides if we're going to engage with that information or we're going to shut down. 
the limbic system is important, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But when you're afraid to stand up in front of an audience, that's your limbic system saying, this is too scary. You're not going to be able to remember what you wanted to say. It's when you freeze up when you're taking a test. So the limbic system is going to be a control center for accessing what's the occipital <laughs> and the temporal lobe is bringing into play. The middle fingers are just above the temporal lobe. That's your parietal lobe. And that's your motor center. So when students are counting on their fingers, when they are using manipulatives, when you're throwing a ball, you are acting on sensory information through movement. Those three lobes, occipital, temporal, and parietal lobes, are what you use to build foundational learning and conceptual understanding. But they are not helpful in problem solving. For that, you need <laughs> the thumbs and the index fingers, which is your forehead, the frontal lobes, or the neocortex. That's where executive functioning, reasoning, problem solving, monitoring your own behavior, deciding if you can set a goal and meet a goal, that all happens when all lobes of the brain are accessed. Now, back to the limbic system. If we separate our hands, the palm of your hand is actually in our model where the limbic system is. That controls attention, retention, and motivation. So how does that happen? Well, if we want students to connect information, they have to have the limbic system say, it's okay to process this information. And as students start to connect information, they build mental schemas. We know from cognitive science, when you have a schema or a mental map of how the information fits together, you can go directly to the neocortex and begin to process that information, which is pretty amazing uh, when you think about it. If students don't build a schema, they have to work a lot harder with their working memory to figure out where the inf new information is supposed to fit with what they already know. So another way to look at this model is, as you see on the screen, engagement starts with the limbic system, and that's emotional engagement first. I'm curious about this. I want to know more about this. This is meaningful to me. That has to happen first. Then when that gate is opened, we start to build conceptual understanding. That understanding can be represented in many ways. Auditory, visual, tactile, motor. And eventually, we solve problems activating our neocortex. This fits really nicely as well with David Kolb's experiential learning cycle, where he says the way we learn is we begin by saying, why is this important to me? So if you're using project-based learning and you're using a driving or essential question, you are launching students into a topic through media, video, case studies, an event, a simulation. So they want, they're invested in it. They're curious about it. They want to learn more about it. Then they're ready to learn the facts. They are emotionally engaged. Now they're ready to get cognitively engaged with generalizing ideas, reading about it, exploring it. And when that foundation is solid enough, and it doesn't have to be totally mastery, but it's got to be solid enough so that they can work more independently. Groups can work. Groups can investigate further, raise their own questions. The teacher now becomes more of a coach. And in the end, they are planning authentic products. They are sharing, getting feedback from peers. They can raise new questions and present their findings to an authentic audience outside of the classroom. In the end, it's all about teaching students skills so that they can own the skills and drive the learning. And that means we as educators have to step back and allow it to happen more as a coach than as a director of learning. Check out my new book, Rigor by Design, Not Chance. Thank you.